course books in our time of worship. Toward the back, you'll see the hymn, The Christ of the Cross, and uh, some of the tune of the old rugged cross. But it's not the cross we worship, it's the Christ of the Cross. <laughs> On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. It was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I cherish the price of the cross till his trophies at last he brings home. I will cling to the Christ of the cross and I'll praise him in glory that day. The Christ of the cross so despised by the world as a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear sin on dark Calvary. So I'll cherish the Christ of the cross till his trophies at last he brings home. I will cling to the Christ of the cross and I'll praise him in glory that day. On the old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. It was on that old cross, Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish the Christ of the cross till his trophies at last he brings home. I will cling to the Christ of the cross and I'll praise him in glory that day. To the Christ of the cross, I will ever be true. His shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday. For by His grace I am saved, and His glory forever I'll share. So I cherish the Christ of the cross, till His trophies at last He brings home. I will cling to the Christ of the cross, and I'll praise him in glory that day. Have a word of prayer. Gracious Father, as we gather in your presence, make us mindful that indeed we're here for one purpose. And that is to honor and glorify your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, whether it be in our singing, in the reading of the scriptures, or in the preaching of this word. 
my prayer is that you would so fill our hearts and minds with him that there would be no distraction away from him. You know, this flesh is a mighty enemy. And uh, the flesh wrestles against the spirit. But I'm thankful that the spirit of grace is almighty, all-powerful to take such wretched hearts as we have still to direct those thoughts of the Lord Jesus Christ and to his great work accomplished there at Calvary in his life and his death, to your satisfaction, so that we can meet here together in complete peace, knowing that our reconciliation, our redemption, our justification, our sanctification, our wisdom is all in your blessed Son. So we give you the praise and glory in his name and pray that you would Direct us as we open your word. And to the Lord Jesus Christ, your blessed Son alone, be all the glory. Amen. Let's take our Bibles once again and look in Proverbs chapter 22. I'm prayerful that as we've been studying through this book, that we see even more clearly than ever before how all of this pertains to the Lord Jesus Christ. And particularly today as we study here, the title is Words of Truth. And that comes right from our particular text that we're studying. If you look in verse 17, it says, Bow down thine ear and hear the words of the wise. As we saw last time, I believe the best way to read that is let's hear the words of the wise one. There's none wise among men. Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said even the foolishness of God, not that he has any, but by way of comparison, the foolishness of God is wiser than men. So we don't look to men for that wisdom. But here it is referring to Christ himself. And when it says, bow down thine ear." That's a position of submission, that when we come together, even as we are now for worship, that it be to hear a word from him. Not my word, but him. I'm just the spokesman. I'm the voice. But if the only word you hear is my voice, the only explanation you hear is mine, we're all in trouble. I pray that I be that instrument that even as John the Baptist declared, the voice in the wilderness, behold the Lamb. But to bow down the ear is an inclination in humility, which only the grace of God can give. You'll never see Christ in all of his fullness of glory in Scripture unless the Lord gives you ears to hear and eyes to see. Now, natural-minded Men can come through scripture and say, oh yes, this seems to be pertaining to Christ. Or they'll go to another scripture and say, oh, that pertains to Christ. Even the Jews, when they were reading the Old Testament, they looked at certain portions of scripture and said, well, that's messianic. In fact, that's the way I was brought up, to read the scriptures. Look for the messianic portions. No one ever told me. And they can't tell you what they don't know. But I was never taught, even though I paid thousands of dollars to be instructed, that from Genesis to Revelation, it's all about Christ. There's something to think about in Revelation when he said, I'm the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Those are, those are alphabets from A to Z would be the way we would put it. And what are words made up of but A to Z? And he's saying that's who he's about here. So may the Lord give us ears to hear and eyes to see, to hear. That's not just the physical hearing, but the spiritual <laughs> without which none can see Christ. Hear the words of the wise and apply thine heart unto my knowledge. I hear Solomon is speaking as one that the Lord gave that wisdom. There was none wiser than Solomon in all the earth, but that was just but a, an illustration, a physical illustration of who he represented as the Lord Jesus Christ. And when it speaks of the words of the wise, Christ is the word. To apply thine heart unto my knowledge. In other words, Solomon, in the book of Ecclesiastes, that Ecclesiastes means the preacher. 
So Solomon, just like any that are raised up by the Lord, have but one mission, one message, and that is to declare him who is that wisdom and that knowledge. Again, the Lord Jesus Christ. So the words of the wise one. I know I often insist on the word doctrine in Scripture being singular as opposed to doctrines. When you see it in the plural, it's referring to false teaching. So some might look at this and say, why doesn't it say here, bow down thine ear and hear the word of the wise one? Well, even our Lord Jesus Christ, the singularness is in the wise one. That's who Christ is. But as he spoke, he spoke of himself through words. So don't get distracted by that. In fact, over in John chapter 6 and verse 63, our Lord was speaking to people who knew the word in the original language inside and out. I hear some say, well, I need to go learn the Greek or I need to go learn the Hebrew. There were no greater linguists in Christ's day than those Pharisees. They were linguists. And the Lord purposed that the scribes should transcribe the scriptures carefully to where when they were done, they would actually go back and count every punctuation mark. That's what we call jot and tittle. One little change in a mark, even in the Hebrew language, can change the whole significance of the word. If any of you have studied other languages, you know how you can mess up. Sometimes just by an intonation of how you say it. So even though they were blind, yet the Lord purposed that this word be preserved in the copies. Because that's really what we have. We don't have the original. No one has the original. But the copies and what parts of copies that they have dug up since then, like the Dead Sea Scrolls, these were preserved. And the Lord preserved it. They can go and do comparisons and see how exactly what we have here is exactly what was copied. But with all of that, they still did not have an ear to hear. Their ear was not bowed down to the wise one, the Lord Jesus Christ. Here was the word of God himself in the flesh, standing before them, speaking the words of the Father. And the words of the Father give all the glory to the Son. And the words of the Son give all the glory to the Father. That's why Christ said that he didn't speak a word, but what the Father, by his Spirit, gave it to him. But here in John chapter 6 and verse 63, here's what the Lord said as they argued with him, debated about who he was. He says, it is the spirit that quickeneth. And there, I would rather see that word spirit in capital because it's the spirit of God. It is the spirit that quickeneth. None of us can know Christ or his words or who he is as the word, except that the spirit of God Reveal him. The flesh profiteth nothing. So if all we do is approach this word with our intellect and with our own understanding, that profiteth nothing. And here's where he uses the plural. The words. So it's, he's the word, but as he communicates himself as the word, he uses words. The words that I speak unto you they are spirit, and there again I'd put a capital S, and they are life, capital L. Why? Because they reveal him who is that life, the Lord Jesus Christ. But he says there in verse 64, there are some of you that believe not. Don't be surprised that people in our generation, just like we open this word and read it today, have no understanding of this word being all about Christ. It's being preached in as topics, like you know so well yourself, how you were taught to read through the book of Proverbs and try to find a practical application for every day, and that's why God purposed there be 31 
chapters so that every day you can get some kind of boost. It's like taking a vitamin and feel better about yourself and just keep reading. Look for practical application. In fact, there's a version of scripture. I don't call it the Bible. There's a commentary out there on scripture that's called the Life Application Bible. And that's how it's translated. That's how it's written. So you can go through and find life applications. I'll tell you that you can do that all day long to the end of time and miss Christ, just like these Pharisees did. But he says, there are some of you that believe not. We would have to say, sadly, there are many that believe not, that have this word, and yet their ears have never been opened. And here's why. Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. They, he knew from the beginning. They were never given to him by the Father that he should come and work out their salvation and pay their sin debt. People take offense with that because they want, they say, well, to be fair, this ought to be open to everybody and let man be the determining factor. That's not the way it is. This trial was over when Adam fell. So now sinners are cast upon the mercy of the court that God himself should determine and has determined who it is that he will save and who it is that he will condemn. He says there in verse 65, Therefore can I said, said I unto you that no man can come unto me. You know the problem with the word responsibility? It comes from two words actually, responsible, able to respond, there's nothing further than truth in that. You won't find the word responsibility in Scripture. But all you hear people say that. Well, no, you've got God's sovereignty on one hand and you've got man's responsibility on the other. And if God's going to be get his work done, then man has to do his part. You won't find that. Here it says, therefore, I said unto you that no man can. That word can means ability. No one has the ability to come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. So here are these words that the Lord is teaching him who is the Word. And to show that it takes the Spirit of God for our ear to be bowed down in submission and, and humility by his grace. Here's what we read here in verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. They were disciples in name only. They were following the crowds. But when the Lord caused that part of his word to be heard, yet not in the heart, but just in the ears, they rebelled. It proved his point that they went away. And that's when the Lord turned to his disciples. Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Notice how the scriptures put it, to whom shall we go? Not to what shall we go? You'll find people willing to go to a meeting place, a congregation. You'll find people willing to go to the front of a building to make some sort of decision. You'll find people willing to get down into the waters of baptism. You'll find them going to their preacher, but none can come to Christ except it be given them of the Father. And when he asked that question, he was looking at his disciples. And guess who was in that number? Because here it says that, that he spoke to the 12. This is why I say that I'm not confident that even Judas understood the depth of his own depravity and what it was to be a son of perdition. I think most people will think, oh, he's a son of perdition. So he, there are many Christ said that many shall say in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not done many mighty works in your name? And I will say unto them, I never knew you. It wasn't until the very end when Judas was given over to his flesh and Satan's devices that he went and betrayed the Lord. But his walk with those disciples was so deceptive and covered up that even when he went out from that last Passover, the disciples thought he was going out to pay some alms to the poor, as what they did during the Passover, and uh, never perceived or understood that, no, Judas was that one. 
And so it's just to say there are many that hear the words of Christ with their physical ear, even read the word, and yet have never come to Christ. But Peter answered, here by the Spirit of God, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the, here it is again, the words of eternal life. He's the word, but the words of instruction, the words that direct the sinner to Christ, even as we're reading here in the scriptures, many words, but everyone inspired by the Spirit of God for one purpose, to instruct us for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness, in the, the righteousness of God. Not our righteousness, but the, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. And so, Peter declared, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ. See how specific it is? It's not just the Christ or a Christ, that Christ, the son of the living God. And that's where Jesus answered them. Have not I chosen you 12 and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him being one of the 12. But there was no alarm even in Judas at this point. There was no thought of him even being exposed, even though here the Lord declares, one of you is going to be betray me. So every word that we find in Scripture is vital to hear, and that by his grace we be bowed down. He, he says here, so that's the exhortation to the words of truth. When we talk about the words of truth, we're talking about Christ being that truth. He says in verse 18, coming back to my text, Proverbs 22, it is a pleasant thing if thou keep them within thee. <coughs> that word keep means to guard. If whatever the Lord has been pleased to teach us of himself, guard it. For out of the heart are the issues of life. If the Lord should ever take his hand off of us, we would go the way of all flesh. But to keep that notice which was, is within thee. Someone pointed this out to me years ago, and I realized that I had not fully understood the work of the Spirit, how it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. And I'm careful even now to preach in such a way. I'm not just preaching to you, but... I'm preaching for you as one sinner that God has been pleased to save by his grace and pointing you, even as myself, to this one who is the word and who has the words of life. If I can't preach to you or for you out of what has been revealed in my own heart, then it's nothing but a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. I fear that many have some information about Christ they want to share. They want you to know how much they know. And that's all it is, is a lecture. In fact, I despise even that word sermon. Was it a good sermon today? What do you mean, sermon? The question is, was Christ preached? So when you have friends and acquaintances that are attending all these other places of worship, and they ask, well, how was a sermon? It wasn't a sermon. Christ was preaching, I thank God. That's, that's the answer. It's a pleasant thing. That word pleasant is in the sense of the Lord making him precious to our hearts. Christ precious to the heart. And how does he do it? Through the words of truth. The words, I'm using words to declare him who is the truth. And it is a pleasant thing. Think of the shepherd leading the sheep beside the still waters and by the green pastures. That's the gospel. That's pleasant to the ear, pleasant to the heart, needful. And it says, they shall with all be fitted in thy lips. That's my prayers I preach, that what I declare be truly to the honor and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. I will tell you that every time I prepare to preach, I'm mindful that these lips not move, but what it declares the glory of Christ. But I'll be the first to tell you when I'm finished, I haven't even begun. I'd love to begin to declare the glory of Christ as he's so deserving, so worthy.
So it's not just reading this word and trying to find some personal application. No, it's reading it that from the heart, these words of truth, which we're going to see is how it's described in verse 21 by Solomon, that these words of truth indeed be the revelation of him who is the truth. It says that thy trust may be where? In the Lord. Not in the man preaching it. People elevate the preacher above measure today. No, it's like John the Baptist said. He must increase, I must decrease. Behold the Lamb. How simple is that message? The Lamb of God. And I'm mindful to be careful not to explain or try to explain everything. We're talking about the mystery of God. God in the flesh. But certainly to declare him whether men understand or not, take this word and declare that word that thy trust may be in the Lord and not in the man that is declaring it. He says, I have made known to thee this day even to thee. There, Solomon is speaking as the preacher. And I know some would look at Solomon's life and say, well, there are an awful lot of things to criticize in him. Don't look at Solomon's life. This is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. If there's no other testimony, then Solomon could declare is that I'm that sinner and Christ is that Savior. Like one of the old preachers had put on his tombstone when he died. He said, I'm a great sinner, but I have a great Savior. I like that. That's, that's what we're finding here. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, you'll find that this is what Paul determined, knowing himself to be the sinner. And he says this, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. In the Old Testament, there was that, that ark of the testimony, it was called. It was the mercy seat. And in that testimony, it declared how God could be just and justify sinners. Because once a year, not without blood, the high priest went in with the names of those he represented on his breastplate and sprinkled that blood on that ark of the testimony, in which was the law that had been broken, and the manna, which represented Christ, and the rod of Aaron. Those were all put in that ark as a representation of Christ and his work as prophet, priest, and king. And that was the testimony. Well, this is what Paul says here. I didn't come in uh, excellency of speech or of wisdom declaring unto you the testimony of God. Who's the testimony of God? It's his son. He said, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. There's a lot in that. Jesus Christ, that's his person. Him crucified, that's his work, his effectual work to the satisfaction of God the Father. But notice, I determined, it takes that determining not to know anything. When I first sit down to prepare a message and read the Word, there's a lot of things that you study and read, but I always ask the Spirit of God to draw me to one point, and that is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Even with this message, the words of truth, who is the word of truth. That's Christ. And he said, I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. This isn't just a matter of sitting down and putting together a sermon. People ask me, well, can't you just pull an old sermon out sometime when you get busy? Absolutely not. If you came over to my house and I sat you down at the table and I pulled you something out of the freezer that was a little bit moldy, heated it up and put it in front of you, you'd be abhorred. Well, why would we ever do that with regard to the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ? This isn't just a matter of preparing a speech. This is a determination that if I am to preach, and I tell you that all the time, I don't have to preach. I can sit down there right with you if there's somebody that can preach for me. But if I'm asked to preach, I must preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. Let these lips be sealed otherwise. And that's what the word is all about. That was Paul's determination. I was with you in weakness and fear. I don't know if I can even begin to explain 
what it is to take this word and endeavor to preach for you. A lot of you come popping in here, be bopping, and think, oh good, we're going to have a good sermon today. No, it isn't. The hours of preparation, the exercise of heart, my heart, that if I have anything to declare unto you, let it be Jesus Christ and crucified. If I say anything other than that, I'm amiss. And it is with fear. It is in much trembling, not because of people. I've preached to some pretty angry crowds over my lifetime since the Lord taught me the gospel. That's not the fear and trembling. The fear and trembling is who it is I represent, how it is I declare his glory, and what is that work that he accomplished to save wretched sinners such as we are. Fear and trembling. Here it is, my speech. We're talking about words of truth here. He said, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing Words of man's wisdom. God forbid that I should sit down and think, well, what kind of cute outline can I come up with? And they're a bunch of preachers. That's all they want. Remember my outline. They'll pass out little pieces of paper with half of the outline already filled out. And they'll ask you, just fill in the rest like they're in a classroom. And it's a cute outline. It's alliterated and all of this. That's preaching with enticing words of man's wisdom but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power, and this is the, the verse I was getting to, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men. If you don't remember anything else that I preach for you except for the word, God be praised. The word, but in the power of God. And that's where he says in verse 6, how be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, that are perfected, that the Lord has taught, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in the mystery. What is that wisdom of God? That's Christ. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. So that's coming back here to Proverbs 22. What Solomon is writing, that thy trust may be in the Lord. A capital L O R D, sovereign, God, magistrate, the, the one who's the creator, he's the sovereign provider, governor of all things, he's the savior, and he, he's the judge. I've made known to thee this day, even to thee. He says, Have not I written to thee excellent things and counsels and knowledge? Just think about it the excellent things that pertain to the glory of Christ. He says, I have written to thee those things in counsels and knowledge. It's one message. The excellent things of Christ. What more do we need to hear? What more do we want to hear? Give me Christ or I die. And here's where the title originates in verse 21. That I may, might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth. There it is. The certainty of those things that pertain to Christ. The word of truth. There's not room for speculation. I know some like to get up and like to talk about this position. They like to talk about that position. They kind of leave it up to you. Well, you decide. I'm telling you the gospel is not a smorgasbord where you can go through and pick and choose. And you decide, well, I don't like the peas and I don't like the beans, but I'll sit over here with the meat. No. The words of truth pertain to one person. Christ and his glory. And it says that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send unto thee. This is where Peter wrote about to look to the Lord to give a reason of what? The hope that is in you. If the Lord has taught you of Christ, you don't have to go to a script. You don't have to go ask the pastor now, what, what should I say in this situation or that? No, you speak to them of the hope that is in you. How has Christ taught you? I fear that there are many that poly parrot what they've been taught. And that's all they can say. But in so doing, they have no revelation of Christ in their heart. You don't need to fear those that oppose. Look how our Lord, there were times when they came to him and there were times he answered not a word. There are other times where he spoke in such a manner that he brought conviction to the hearts of some. And 
without even being able to visibly see his spirit working. There are times when he opened the hearts of some even as he spoke. And he spoke as he had experienced or knew because he was with the Father from the beginning. And so it is that if he's been pleased to reveal himself in us, that is how we answer, that is how we speak. Tell them how God has been merciful to you, the sinner. People aren't used to hearing that. I remember one time being asked to pray or lead one of these invocations at a huge statewide AFLAC conference down in Lafayette. And I was prayerful as to just address the Lord as he'd been pleased to teach me and not, not pray as if it was a speech to those there. A lot of times that's what it is. But I can remember as the Lord directed me to close the prayer, and I always use the personal pronoun if I'm asked to do that. I don't speak of we or us. It's me and I. And that's how I close the prayer, that thanking God for his grace and mercy to a sinner such as I am. And the murmuring started immediately for any that were there. They could probably remember. There's one associate sitting down in the front row. He leaned over and heard it loud enough in the silence to where he said, did he just say sinner? That's not a term that people want to hear. And yet, as we declare to others, that's where we begin. That I'm a sinner saved by grace. And that grace is manifested in by through the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work alone. How he lived that life of obedience to the satisfaction of God the Father. and How he paid the sin debt for those that the Father gave him. That's our testimony. And that's why here Solomon in teaching us who is that wisdom. Not just what is that wisdom, but who is that wisdom. Declares here that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send unto thee. When you answer the words of truth, all you're doing is declaring the glory of Christ. You want to get people silent in a religious discussion. Sometimes those things just pop up like weeds or like a grenade. All of a sudden you're like, what? Where did that come from? But if asked a reason of the hope that's in you, if you want to turn that conversation, bring silence, then bring it to Christ. Who he is, why he came, what he accomplished, for whom he came, and where he is now. I dare say you won't even get down through those particular questions before people are distracted and off onto something else, because you're speaking of something they know nothing of. So these are the words of truth, that God has purposed that sinners such as us should know, him who is the truth. And as we read on, you can see people think, well, now he's moved on to another subject. No. How did Christ live? Here when it says in verse 22, rob not the poor, because he is poor, neither oppress the afflicted in the gate. That's what the Pharisees were doing. They thought themselves above the poor. They, in fact, enriched themselves by their positions. But Christ didn't come to rob the poor. He came to save the poor. You see, it's just the contrast of what men and their depravity will do. Oppressing the afflicted in the gate, thinking that someone else is in that particular state they're in because they're a worse sinner than you are. God forbid we should ever think that way. Here are the words of truth. That he humbled himself. He that is the, the embodiment of, of wisdom and knowledge, a treasure of wisdom and knowledge. And he being rich, yet for our sakes became poor. He didn't come to add a burden to us. When it says poor, we have nothing to offer. And yet the words of truth declare that he is that one who took that sinner's place. Notice here in verse 23, that again, this is depicting Christ. Through these words of truth, it says, For the Lord will plead their cause and spoil the soul that of those that spoil them. Religion is a, a terrible dictator, taskmaster, just like in Egypt. That's why Egypt is a picture of false religion. 
it can only incur more affliction. And yet the Lord, hearing the cry of his people, delivered them through that Passover lamb. That's our testimony. We don't plead our cause in our depravity and affliction, but the Lord pleads that cause. He's the advocate. And he pled that cause ere we ever knew him. When the Lord opened my eyes, I just found out what God had already done through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and paying my sin debt and justifying me the sinner. For a while in my ignorance and darkness, I thought, well, this is a cooperation. God did his part, and I need to do it now. Notice here, all the glory belongs unto God, for the Lord will plead their cause. Now here again, it warns us against false associations when it says in verse 24, make no friendship with an angry man. That's what men are by nature. If you live to try to appease men, you can only, as it says here, go with a furious man. There's no help among men. Where's our help? Well, it's in the Lord Jesus Christ, who came to save sinners. Lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. Now that's speaking of men that follow men and that have their own determination at heart. They want what they want. And souls that follow such men end up in a snare to their own soul. There's no help with man. That's what that scriptures teach us. If there were, then Christ wouldn't have come. And be not thou of them that strike hands or of them that are sureties for debts. It's talking about here, if you have a particular debt, don't strike hands with somebody that's only going to make it worse, because that's what they do. They don't not they say, Well, I'll take care of your debt, but oh, by the way, you're going to be my bond servant forever. That's not how Christ dealt with us. He didn't strike hands with sinners to work out a payment somehow and inflicting interest on that. The Lord Jesus Christ struck hands with his father. And that from eternity, that he should be the one to come and be that kinsman redeemer. Not adding burden to those that he came to save. It says, if thou hast nothing to pay, why should he take away thy bed from under thee? That's describing those that strike hands with preachers or denominations. And they think that somehow they're going to get some relief spiritually by identifying with these that are nothing but hucksters and destroy the soul. Why? Because they're not pointing sinners to Christ. You know, if the sinner walks to that door and sits down, I want to point them to the Lord Jesus Christ as the sin bearer, as the surety, as the one who came and paid the debt. Nothing required of the sinner. Christ having taken all of that upon himself. So again, those are the words of truth that warn us against false associations or looking to the arm of the flesh in any way to cover our debt. Now, unless Christ has paid that debt, no man can help you. But people put themselves in bondage under false religion and false preachers, and they make these vows and determinations. And they got people walking the aisle and dedicating and rededicating their life. It's nothing but a bondage. And the debt remains because there's no satisfaction when you're subject to men. But with God, if Christ has paid your debt, can you hear that? Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin hath left a guilty stain, but he washed me white as snow. Is there any better news than that? I'm thankful the Lord has delivered me from under men's obligations. And then we finish here with diligence and holding to what the Lord himself has established. Remove not the ancient landmark. There's a whole message even in that, which thy fathers have said. There's people today wanting to move the landmark. The landmark has to do with surveying the land and putting down that plot and determining the bounds. The Lord has determined the bounds. He has set the landmark from old that if any sinner is to be saved, it's going to be in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. These are the words of truth. But men try to move that. They keep trying to move the boundary. Keep trying to change it. Keep trying to say, no, this that's outdated. The scriptures are outdated. But you don't remove that ancient landmark. This goes all the way back into eternity. 
what God's purpose shall be. And in time, God has set that landmark in the person and work of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's been set when it says, which thy fathers have set. Jude spoke of that faith once delivered unto all the saints all the time. What is that? That's Christ, the faith. We dare not move that landmark or try to add man's will or man's works to it. It says, Seest thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. That's true in life, but here particularly. Who is that diligent man? Christ said, Don't you know I must be about my father's business? See thou that man diligent in his business? Like spoken of there in Isaiah, he'll not rest. Until he has brought judgment to the isles. Judgment in what sense? Satisfy God's law and justice. That's what Naomi told Ruth. Sit here. Until Boaz had settled the matter. Boaz was that man who was diligent. And went and represented these women that had no representation. But served as their kinsman redeemer. And thereby... They were delivered. He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. We're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ here. Who came, lived, died, and rose again. Where is he now? He's seated at the right hand of the Father, the majesty on high. You can't have any greater king than that than God himself. But guess what? He represents. When it says he's seated, that means the work's finished. And he represents such poor sinners as we are. Those are just some words of truth that the Lord has put upon my heart to speak to you about. And I'm happy to say that apart from him, I have no hope. May the Lord bless this word as we've heard. Lord willing, we'll meet back here in a few minutes.